This new Kirsten Dunst movie, Civil War, was the number one movie in the box office this past weekend. I think it's a compelling and sometimes frustrating movie that poses a lot of challenging questions. Today on the podcast, we'll get into what Civil War tells you about this moment right now. Melamine Abdul Mahmoud, this is Commotion. I've been waiting for this conversation all week. I want to get into Alex Garland's new film, Civil War. This is a movie that is set in the near future. It imagines what a new civil war in the United States might look like. And then what the movie does is it puts you in the position of shadowing a group of journalists as they make their way through a bunch of war torn states. Here's a bit of the trailer. Are you serious? The United States are vaporized. They shoot this on sight in the Capitol. I've never been scared like that before, and I've never felt more alive. God bless America. Okay, so here's the thing about Civil War. It does a bunch of interesting things, but one of the most interesting things about it is you never find out the why. You never find out why this war is happening. There are sometimes, I think, some vague details here and there, like the president, for example, played by Nick Offerman, has disbanded the FBI. We end up finding out that California and Texas have formed an alliance, which is quite an unlikely alliance. Then otherwise, what you're doing is you're just following this veteran war photographer, played by Kirsten Dunst, whose own politics and feelings kind of remain a bit of a mystery throughout the movie. I spoke to Omar al Eckert and Rad Simon Pillay about Civil War, and I started by asking Omar to describe this version of America that we find ourselves in. Yeah, I thought it was a really clever trick to avoid getting bogged down in the kind of fight that this movie pretends to want to pick, but then actually doesn't want to pick at all. Mm. Um, so, for example, you have these Western forces, and I, I suspect, I'll never be able to prove, but I suspect that California and Texas is a very deliberate choice because even though if you go to the Inland Empire in California, you'll know that parts of California are incredibly right wing. California is still shorthand for left wing in American political discourse. Yes. Whereas Texas is the exact opposite. And if you couple them together in this patently nonsensical, (laughs) non-realistic way, you get to avoid having a conversation about who the extremists are or who the resistance is. And you see this sort of repeatedly throughout the movie. Um, They go to a camp for internally displaced people, and uh, the people running the camp are from the World Relief Program, something so vague. Global Relief World or something, yes. Uh, Yeah, exactly, right? Like the fact that you and I could sit here for 20 minutes and just come up with various (laughs) permutations of those three words (laughs) is exactly what's intended, right? I think it's a movie that is barging in through the door, trying to be very loud and provocative, but when it comes down to the specific details does not want to get bogged down in a conversation about who's in the right or who's in the wrong. It wants to say extremism is bad and then kind of move on. Yeah, my read on this is that it's definitely a movie that wants to play on the conversations that everybody's having about political polarization without, you know, preventing a certain set of the audience from coming into the theater. But Rad, I'm going to start with the positives from you. What what about this movie worked for you? I mean, I think there's actually quite a bit that worked for me because like Alex Garland, he's a filmmaker who knows how to concoct some really stunning images and moments. Yes. Uh, You know, like I, and and I would say like, like uh, I think he's a great collector of images and moments without necessarily building them into a satisfying whole. And I feel that way, even about ex machina, and and annihilation Annihilation, which are his two yeah right so in this movie i mean you think of like the image of like when when uh kirsten dunst's character is watching the the news and you see a map of the united states reflected on her window and there's an explosion that rocks the window and that map shakes like that's a cool image yeah okay when they're when they're driving through embers it's a very apocalypse now image when jesse plemons's face is an apocalyptic image like whether he's asking you about (laughs) frito-lay or what kind of american you are right like like he's got a lot of and i think my favorite scene in this movie and the scene that almost sold the movie for me is when they uh when they arrive at the small town and they're like and the, the, the people in the small town are like oh we just stay out of it yeah. they're like we, we, we stay completely neutral it's like the war, war never like, touched their town like that's the war the, never yeah. touched their town yeah. yeah and then it and then the camera pans up and you see all these shooters on their rooftops protecting the town so it's like oh yeah yeah we stay out of it at gunpoint 
right? right. And there's so much to kind of pull out of that. Is that, I mean, it, you, the easy, like the easy kind of, I guess, relevance to that scene is like, okay, this is like America itself that says it's, it's staying out of other people's conflicts, but then it's doing so at our gunpoint. It's because it's armed to the teeth. But it's also, I wonder, the generous reading of that is that, is that Alex Garland kind of pointing out that this neutrality that he romanticizes is all bull? I, uh, first of all, this the idea of images that stick with you. Like, this movie is just chock full of them from beginning to mm-hmm. the end. Um, the, mo- this, the, the image that I keep returning to is like the shot of two, two of the main characters as shot like behind this helicopter that has been, you know, felled in a JC right. Penny parking lot. And it just like, it look is visually, genuinely just visually stunning. But, the, you're right about the idea of like here are a bunch of images and here's what they amount to in terms of what they actually want to say and those are two different conversations because I feel like Alex Garland's ability as a technical director is astonishing and it's at work in this movie but in terms of his commentary that's the stuff that people have been fighting about like that's the stuff that I've seen the internet sort of torn apart about whether you know this movie is really trying to say something about America in this moment or is this movie actually like not interested in that particular question is just kind of interested in the mechanics of you know a road trip movie that also is going through a civil war, uh, Omer. When you when you first watched the trailer for this film, you know you thought it looked, in your words, incredibly trite. And then then you actually watched the movie. How did the movie turn out for you? I don't think it was a bad film. Um, I think it was an incredibly instructive movie, whether mm. it wanted to be or not, on the state of American political discourse as it exists right now. Yeah, where if you're living in this country, hell, if you're living in the West in general you are watching right-wing political parties essentially obliterate the mechanics of of democracy. You're watching a slaughter on the other side of the planet that's paid for with your tax dollars. You're watching these incredibly violent things that are not just things in of themselves, but are projections of what's coming. Hmm. But you also might have to go to dinner parties with people who support those things. And so one of the sort of central talking points and avenues of rhetorical safety that a lot of people have retreated into is this notion that there's bad things happening on all sides Mm. and extremists on all sides are bad and bad things are bad and so on and so forth. And I think this movie, whether it wants to or not, is such a fantastic distillation of that. I agree completely. The imagery is is stunning. Um, Not just the imagery, but the, the soundtrack choices, which are incredibly adventurous. There's a lot of technical really marvelous stuff happening. Kirsten Dunst is doing an amazing job. Yeah. Um, But fundamentally, I think it's a political movie by virtue of its negative space, where you have this film that is desperately wanting for the moral righteousness of resistance, but also the comfort and stability of empire. And those are two fundamentally opposing things. And what you end up with is a kind of mush. Mm -hmm. It's very, very loud, very provocative, not really seeming to say very much at all. Yeah, let me let me give you let, let me give people who are listening some of the examples of this um, attempts to avoid this pinning down of the politics in the movie. You know, for example, when we first meet Kristen Dunst um, and Jesse, the young journalist who uh, really adores her character Lee. Um, says to her, oh, you made your name during the Antifa massacre. It doesn't say whether it's Antifa committing the massacre or whether it was Antifa who were being massacred. It's just kind of like, well, this sort of vague political event is the thing that happened. Um, It wants to terribly avoid any kind of commitment to say like, hey, extremists on the right are bad and extremists on the left are are, are also bad bad in the same way. Um, When like, the last 10 years of American uh, news cycles sort of confirmed with people that extremism on the right has gotten particularly violent. And like there's really one political party that is interested in the mechanics of insurrection, for example. Do you think this movie actually commits to an apolitical frame or do you see it as as Omer says, which is to say through avoiding answering these questions, that's its own answer in its own way? This is why Alex Garland makes it mo- so difficult, right? Yeah. Because it's not like this. It's not to say that this movie is apolitical. I feel like we're using the long ra- wrong language when we're saying it's not yeah. a political movie. Because of course, there's gestures towards sure. everything you're talking about, right? Like Nick Offerman, there are shades of Trump in him. If I, I, I sometimes I get the feeling that people want this to be a movie that lambasts Trump because we're going into an election year and he's sure. up for election. And and I didn't. I don't need that from this movie in terms of complicating the politics so that we can't really suss out what this movie is trying to say i do think that's that's a cop-out right because mm. i do think what you're doing here is 
you are mo- making a movie that is cosplaying as a serious film, as a right. provocative film that is coming out in the middle of, you know, c- called Civil War, coming out in election year. The most you can say is that, well, fascism is harmful. Nationalism <laughs> is harmful. Which is um, true. You know, you know, it's fa- true, yeah. Not but Zack Snyder made the same point in Batman <laughs> versus Superman. So if you can't one-up Zack Snyder in your movie's politics... What 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 what's happened here? Like, I mean, I think for me, what really where it really loses out is that that you don't have any conversation about any kind of ideological tension expressed through these characters because again, you're romanticizing the neutrality of these characters, and what you end up doing is just short thrifting your characters as well. Okay, I have a lot of thoughts about where this movie wants to go in terms of what it has to say about journalists and their role right now, but we're going to take a quick break. We'll be back in just a second. All right, we're back. My name is Alameen Abdul Mahmoud, and this is Commotion. Let's get back to it. I'm talking to Omar al and Rad Simon Pillay, and we're talking about this new movie, Civil War. Uh, the director, Alice Garland, by the way, was on cue with Tom Power recently, and I recommend going out to check that conversation wherever you get your podcast. But I just want to play you guys a quick clip from that interview. Let's hear it. And the film is trying to function like a reporter itself. So it's, it's trying to remove its own bias and just showing you a sequence of events in the way a journalist would. When I s- told people I was going to make a film, particularly guy in the film industry, I said, I want to make a film where journalists and the heroes are the heroes. And they said, don't do that. Everybody hates journalists. And it freaked me out. Absolutely freaked me out because journalists are like doctors. You do need them. I would say Right now, there are problems of exactly the sort that journalism is required to fix. Mm. So I get not exactly conspiracy theorists, but I start to look at who is undermining trust in journalism and why. There is a lot going on in everything that Alex Garland just said. But Rad, let me just get your reaction. What do you make of what he just said? I mean, look like, okay, so on the one hand... I don't know that he's wrong because yes, there is this sentiment of fake news and Trump is certainly feeding into that. And like in the era of social media complicating what we know is real, like, yes, there is this distrust that is contributing, this distrust of journalism that is contributing to the divisiveness of it all. Right. Yeah. But like, look, if, if this is the conversation you want to have the conversation about how people view journalism and neutrality and journalism or objective truth and stuff, then let's have that conversation. Like let's actually have it not just like kind of romanticize this kind of ideal that you believe journalism is. Cause right now what we're seeing is more objective truth coming from on the ground in Gaza with people using social media than we are from the you know establishments that are so-called professional journalists, right? We mm-hmm. are seeing that there are certain agendas being served. There's certain cow-towing going on in places like the New York Times, right? So this idea, uh, you know, and those are like, you know, meanwhile, like well, the like, people to who your are- To your point, like, you know, people like CNN, for example, in order to embed with the IDF inside of Gaza, they have to sort of follow a certain set of rules that the, that the IDF sort of lays out. So exactly. that it, certainly news organizations are, abiding by certain rules that are laid out by yeah. particularly interested parties. But sorry, sorry to cut you off. Continue. Well, no, and, and, yeah. and but that's the thing. It's like to, to, to then believe that these individual journalists don't have any kind of biases, are not informed by the people they might be working for and whatnot. I, I think that is naive. Hmm. And for you to use that as your shield to not actually have any real conversations is just, it, I mean, I think that that's where, you know, you, your, your whole movie falls apart. Well, it, certainly, Omar, when you watch this movie, you go, actually, I'm not really sure that you're making a good case for the neutrality of journalism. Like, I don't, I don't, th- I don't think you watch this movie and go, yeah, this is the best model of journalism that will serve people for, for, for the journalists to completely disappear themselves and not at all appear anywhere on the camera. What would you make of the stuff that Alex Garland was just saying? So this notion that everybody hates journalists, well, I mean, that can't be entirely true. You still have a show, or not everybody hates journalists, right? So let's name them. Who In hates spite journalists? of some people's, you know. In yeah, spite but of my repeated letters to the CBC, <laughs> which they will not return. Um, there's there's a, the leading Republican candidate for president has repeatedly called journalists enemies of the people, mm-hmm. right? There's a lot of the center right, including the Democratic Party in the United States, who hate Palestinian journalists because they are presenting a version of events that directly makes a grotesquerie out of the the image that these folks are trying to sell. Hmm. Now, whether you agree or disagree with anything I've just said, at least I've said something. 
Right. And and this goes back to the way that the journalism is presented in this movie. I don't think is factually incorrect. I think there's parts that are hyperbolic for sure, but that's movie making. Um, it goes back to this idea of the fundamental purpose of journalism, which is to name the thing, mm -hmm. to say what happened. Right. And you can try and lean on the supposed neutrality and objectivity of journalism, which has never been there from the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, you can't be a journalist and be completely objective and neutral. Um, you have to want to make things better on some level. But also, this is journalism within the context of a piece of art that you chose to make. So <laughs> you could have gone and done journalism, right? I'm sure he has the resources yeah. to go to any part of the world that needs desperately journalism right now to try and do it. But you chose to make a work of art and a work of overtly political art. You can't then selectively hide behind the supposed impartiality of journalism in the way that the movie quite literally does. When things get too intense, suddenly we get a bunch of still shots of what <laughs> is happening. That's right. Um, you can't keep doing that and sort of have your cake and eat it too. I don't think this was a bad movie, but I do think it's a movie that has a bunch of ejector seat buttons. Omar, listen, you've been in real war zones as a journalist, and then you have to sit down in a movie theater, you know, and then Nicole Kidman comes on the screen and she says, we come to this place for magic. And you have a popcorn and a drink in front of you, and then you watch this movie. It, that's got to be a bit of a distance between the reality of being a journalist in a war zone and then, you know, the the fictionalized, you know, um, interpretation of it. Did this movie sort of pull the real threads of what it's like to report in war zones? I think in a lot of ways it did. Okay. Um, like I said earlier, it's sort of there's areas that are particularly hyperbolic. This sort of adrenaline rush, I think, um, whoever the guy is that's traveling around with Kirsten Dunst, I think turns it up to 11 a little bit too much. Wagner Mora, yes. Seen, yeah. <laughs> I've seen people sort of do their versions of this. And sure. I stuck around towards the end of the credits to see who their consultants were because I, I strongly suspect that a lot of these actors were sent to hazardous environment training, which is what the insurance companies force newspapers and media outlets to hmm. send their journalists to before they go to um, to war zones. Um, and so things like, for example, when the older um, the older reporter who's with them for part of that movie tells the younger one to get sleep whenever she can. Yeah. That's a thing that every one of the soldiers who teaches these hazardous environment training courses will tell they you will get that. sleep whenever yeah. you can. It's that line verbatim I heard when I was when I was doing that training. Yeah. Um, the difficulty, I think, where – and I don't blame the movie for this because it's very hard to do. The difficulty in having any more accurate an assessment of journalism than what is presented in this movie is that so much of journalism is not only very boring but also <laughs> difficult to describe in a clean narrative sense that still allows you to root for a hero. Um, mm. So on the former front, if you went to the NATO airfield when we were stationed there and you went into the Canadian media tent – most of the time, all you would see is four people sitting at their computers clacking away, getting rejections to their freedom of information. That's not that sexy, Omer. Store. I was told. It's incredibly unsexy. <laughs> um, it's deeply unsexy, right? Um, yeah. The other part of it is that a lot of your favorite war reporters, a lot of the stuff you read every day from these correspondents wasn't found out by them. It mm. was a fixer. It was a local. In Afghanistan, one of the most effective fixers was a guy who used to be a surgeon. An Afghanistani guy who made more money running around to dangerous parts of the country and filing stories for these reporters that they would then later throw their names on mm. or grabbing information for them. Um, he made more money doing that than practicing medicine. How the hell do you put that into a movie and still have the person getting the fixer's reports and translating them into a story and putting his name on it? How do you make that person look like the hero? It's not so it's, there's a difficulty there, right? Yeah. Um, but otherwise, I thought they did a fairly admirable job. Uh, Rad, just before we wrap up here, we should say this is a movie that comes from A24. They put a lot of money into this thing. They gross over $25 million. It won the box office. It, it had their best ever opening weekend for A24. What do you make of this strategy for A24 to do this with Civil War and Alex Garland? I, you know, this is actually really fascinating because it's a fascinating transition for A24. Because So anyone who's familiar with A24... We are talking about a boutique indie distributor. And they make smaller house. movies, sort of. You make know, smaller movies. Quirky These movies. Are the guy, yeah. They made their name on Spring Breakers yeah. and then Moonlight. 
They are more of an art house. They they are a distributor and a label that prides themselves on investing in auteurs, auteur yeah. cinemas. They are f- a filmmaker's brand. Uh, they uh, and, but then lately they've had to kind of shift gears and make more commercial cinema because the math wasn't mathing, especially after they poured way too much money on Bo is Afraid, right? Like they on on that's Ari a Joaquin Oster's Phoenix map. movie that yes, the, exactly. Yeah. So between that and then also David Lowry's Green Knight, like they're, yeah. they're, they're the, the idea of throwing money at, at auteurs to make whatever they want, they they set themselves up in their own Heaven's Gate scenario. It's not paying out. Now they want to make more commercial cinema. Civil War is now you got the director of Ex Machina. They gave him fifty million dollars to yeah. make. I, I'll be at a spectacle, but look, we've been talking about it for almost half an hour now. So yeah, a spectacle stuff that get. is still auteurist, yeah. right? Like, yeah. or like, or the populist idea of auteurist. So I'm digging this. If you know, if a studio out there wants to, you know, wants to throw money at directors to to, to and find a viable way, a commercially viable way to make auteurs, you know, still exist and get their ideas out, I'm all for it. I think the danger is because even when A24 was sort of doing its cool, oh, look, we got Lady Bird, we got Greta Gerwig. They were kind of falling into certain formulas. The elevated horror trend started falling into a certain formula. The A24 brand started having its own kind of familiarity in the way that Marvel was. It was yeah. almost like indie cinema's answer to Marvel. So there's a risk, a danger of them kind of slipping into their own formulas by pursuing this direction. But I am all for any company that still wants to throw, throw even more money at filmmakers with voices. Omar, I'm going to give you the last word on this. What does it say to you that... There's so much appetite for this movie that it is the number one movie at the box office after it opens in this moment. I think you're going to see a lot more of this sort of stuff uh, in the near future. You know, I was driving home from a writing workshop. I teach at an MFA program out here, and we do this thing on the coast, and we were driving back. And I was driving back with one of my students. And for reasons that are inexplicable to me, I swear I did not bring this up, she decided to talk to me about what was going on in Gaza. It felt like she was trying out opinions on me Hmm. that she thought might work to satisfy everyone in the car and and everyone generally. And it kept coming back to this notion of it's all so complicated and there are bad things being done on on all sides. And I could see the relief in her voice as she was trying out this opinion because it was a way to pretend like you're not looking away from something horrible, but also not say something that was going to get you in trouble or get someone offended it's just such a compelling position to it's take a because it feels position. like you're saying something when you're actively not. And and it's dangerous because fascists know what to do with that kind of centrism. You just move a little further towards fascism and the centrist has to move along with you because their main position is to be in the center of things. So I think it's a kind of um, projection of what we're going to see in the next few years Mm -hmm. where it's going to sound provocative to say that there's extremists on all sides and you're going to get civil war type productions i don't know that that's a particularly good thing but i think it's going to be a very popular thing omar i i appreciate you being here i appreciate you always being provocative pal thanks for being here don't know why you keep having me back, but I appreciate it. <laughs> of course. Rats on play. Uh, this is the first time we've close to agreed on anything, so it's been a delight. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, as always, for, for being here, friend. They, they, thanks for, for bringing me into such a such elevated convo. <laughs> <laughs> Anytime. You guys are the best. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Omar Lekhead is a former Globe and Mail journalist and author of the novels American War and What Strange Paradise. He was in Oregon. Rad Simon Pillay is a freelance film critic and regular here on Commotion. He was in Toronto. You can listen to that interview, by the way, with the director of Civil War, Alex Carlin, on Q with Tom Power, wherever you get your podcasts. Dream, baby, dream. Dream, baby, dream. I gotta tell you, another great thing about this movie, but Civil War, is it's got a great soundtrack. This is from that movie. That's a little bit of the song Dream Baby Dream by Suicide. Sturgill Simpson shows up on the soundtrack. Della Soul is on the soundtrack. Civil War is playing in select theaters right now. And that is it for the show. Remember, you can find us on Instagram. We are at CommotionCBC. My name is Alameen Abdul Mahmoud. I'm gonna be back tomorrow. I'll see you then. Dream, baby, dream.